All right, welcome back. So, in this lesson, now, the last lesson I said we'd be talking about, you know, what would going to be done about these growing problems in Rome. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to be talking about a lot of these things, or a lot of these, again, what I call band-aid fixes uh, to deal with this. So, but just looking over this one more time, again, I don't know if you're just watching this video right after the last one or if it's been a few days, uh, but please be looking over this. Again, this isn't all the problems, but it, like the problems I'm showing here are definitely showing a major crack in, in that initial, uh, those foundations of power and prosperity that, that Rome was built on. Like you're seeing those foundations cracking with what you're looking at here, kind of uh, this undermining and manipulation of basically those same people that have been building you up in the first place, that have been the core reason for your expansion. Uh, namely, basically your small farmers that are just very patriotic and willing to go to war. Uh, when they're asked to, and again, provide, and again, for free, essentially. Um, I can't really totally say for free, but more so than anybody else in history. You still got to be fed. But anyways, um, where was I? Oh, so it's not like they look at this, like the Romans look at this as like, what is going on? How do we deal with this? Well, and just like in any situation, you have people that look at this and say, you know, there's, there's a right thing to do. We need to do what's right by, by Rome. We need to do what's right by these people who have been wronged. Then you also get people that are like, well, we can make something out of this. Uh, we, we can enrich ourselves off of this situation. We can turn a bad situation into a good situation. I can advance my own personal motives to gain power and things like that. And, you know, then all of these type of things start working against each other. And that is definitely seen in this first group, or this first, you could say, idea of... of um, I don't know why that shadow's there. Oh, well, there's all the notes for you. I'll just put them all up. So basically we get into the infamous Gracchus brothers and the Gracchus reforms. So basically this isn't just them, but the reforms I'm going to talk about center around them because they become the guys that push this. Tiberius being the elder brother, Gaius being the younger brother. And these reforms take uh, go over like years and years. I almost want to say decades, maybe almost 20 years worth of time, 15 years worth of time those reforms are in place where basically uh, these two guys see a way around this. They're like, you know what? We have this huge poor class uh, in Rome. You know, they've kind of been wronged by their country. You know, what can we do to kind of solve this? And also just having a lot of poor people in Rome, it just looks bad. You know, I just, this, we can't have this, you know, and they, and so they come up with this idea. I should say Tiberius, well, Tiberius along with some other co-conspirators, um, come up with this idea is like, you know what, we have all this, all this land in other areas, like in Spain, in North Africa, in Greece, in Illyricum, uh, even in Northern Italy now that are basically going to Northern Italy, the Po River Valley and getting into the Alps Mountains a little bit and just beyond the Alps Mountains and Southern Gaul, which is today Southern France, like uh, Asia Minor, they have all this new land. Yet every single time something happens out there, uh, you know, they have to raise an army from Rome to send it out there to deal with it. Well, they come up with this idea of saying, you know what, we have all these people here in Rome. What if we basically set up settlements in all of these other places, like in Spain, North Africa, Southern Gaul, Greece, and, uh, and Asia Minor? You know, and so we can send all of these basically down on the luck people with their families and settle these areas. And so they, along with their kids, can become a growing Roman group of people in these areas that we can call on to raise armies in those areas. And this way they get land, they kind of get paid back for, uh, for their service. If they're just a down on, luck on their person, a down on their luck type of poor person, you know, this is a chance for them to really just kind of grow, get up out of the ashes and, you know, uh, and basically make a new life for themselves somewhere else, but still be very, very Roman. This sounds like a great, great idea. And this is, when I say Band-Aid fix, this is definitely a Band-Aid fix where it's like, okay, uh, and it's, it's awesome. Well, I should, I should say it's awesome. That's us looking back on it and saying, this is a great idea. You know, um, uh, this idea of like, hey, yeah, let's settle these people. It's also, at least I should put it this way. It's a great idea from a Roman perspective. <laughs> I don't know. If you're, let me say, living in North Africa, I don't know if you'd think it would be a great idea or in Spain. Um, but again, it's from the Roman perspective, a very good fix. It seems like I can solve the problem. Now, this ticks a lot of people off. Uh, for one, uh, Tiberius does, 
skirts the law, let's put it that way, that's being nice. He skirts the law and tradition, you know, hundreds of years of established Roman tradition and some laws to kind of get this through, to kind of get his way. Really makes a lot of uh, people ticked off at him. Um, and at the same time, it seems like Tiberius makes a lot of these decisions, not necessarily to help out these poor people, but to enrich himself and to, or to empower himself, kind of get a lot of power within Roman society almost uh, unchallengeable power, you could say. Uh, and it's hard not to look at the actions of Pisistratus. And again, this it might be just the way I'm reading this a little bit. It's hard to look at what, it, did I just say Pisistratus? I think I did. It's hard to look at Tiberius and not see him as a Pisistratus. Uh, but either way, it's the whole idea that you could say he's doing right by the people to gain more power for himself. But because he does tick off a lot of people, he gets killed over this. Now, these brothers are not killed at the same time, by the way. Gaius is actually much younger than Tiberius. So Tiberius kind of comes out first and pushes these reforms. And Gaius comes out second, but Tiberius does get murdered. And he gets murdered in broad daylight. Um, and it's one of those things where like, everybody's like, oh, well, okay. Like, it's, you know, of course, it made a lot of people mad. It shouldn't have happened. It was definitely a murder. Um, but it was just kind of let go. Uh, Gaius, you could argue, was a little bit more smart about things. Um, he kept pushing these reforms and got a couple more, uh, got one more, more major reform on this to help out, you could say, the, the poor Roman urban class. Uh, but he is also murdered, and his murder was more kind of behind the, uh, behind the screen type thing, you know, it wasn't in broad daylight. But even though they were both murdered for these reforms that they get through, and whether or not they were they were altruistic, meaning that they really meant this and had good motivation for it, or they're doing it for their own personal reasons, um, it does help out Rome, you could say, in many facets, where, yes, now they do have Romans in other areas of the Mediterranean, and enough of them where they could be called on to form a legion or two to kind of keep the peace, or to go to war immediately if need be, and then wait for those reinforcements to come in from Rome, those larger, like, four, five, six legion type of armies. Uh, and now, the reason why this is a Band-Aid fix, though, why this isn't a permanent good, all good fix, is it doesn't solve the problem that is really showing up in the first place, and that is, is that you're getting a lot of Romans, mostly at the top at this point, that are turning away from those foundations of power and prosperity, meaning that Yes, this is a fix, but it's a short-term fix. You still have this idea that people are out there saying, well, I can still manipulate the system. I can still use the system to get power for myself. Um, I don't really have to live by these values myself as long as I expect other people to live by them. You know, that problem is still there. And so, of course, pro more, it's going to happen again, which, ha which well, happens again. So basically, a, a few decades after the Gracchus brothers, you get into a point where, well, Sorry, ignore the marriage reform thing here. But a few decades after the Gracchus brothers' whole thing uh, goes down, Rome's in the same mess. You know, again, they have another major urban poor situation on their hands. Um, it's being tougher, and it's getting tougher and tougher to raise armies because now there's a heck of a lot of people that don't even qualify uh, to basically be called up in the army because you actually have to have like land qualifications to be called up into the army. You can't. Like they can't call any of these former soldiers in Rome uh, to come up, even though they're good veterans and things like that, because they don't have the land requirements according to law to do that. And so again, it's just these cracks are just kind of ruining what they were built on in the first place. Um, and again, they keep starting wars they don't need to. Well, again, that's us saying it today, or maybe me saying that right now is like those wars aren't necessarily necessary to do, but whatever. Uh, in comes a guy named Marius, and this is, <laughs> I'm going to have to just be really simplistic here too, this, uh, go, there's a lot to say about Marius, interesting guy, to say the least, in Roman history, is he good, is he bad, well, I'm not going to get into that <laughs> right now, but let's just put it this way, Marius sees this problem and sees a way to fix it, so he says, all right, let's get rid of the law that says you have to own land to be part of the army. And then he goes a step further and says, now that we've done that, let's take all of these basically people that we have, these poor men, down the luck men that we have this time, and let's form them into armies that are permanent. Let's not worry about having to raise legions every single time we need to go off to war and, and you know, kind of we have a slow response, you could say. We could have standing armies 
all over the Roman Republic, all over kind of our, our, our holdings and colonies and, and subjugated areas, so that we can definitely enforce Roman rule and Roman law and Roman way of life everywhere. You know, it, you know a standing army that is paid. Again, this completely changes what Rome is all based on. Uh, like the marriage reforms, seen as one of the greatest band-aid fixes of all time, amazing in the short term. You know, where yeah, social tensions. No, well, let's put it this way: social tensions with the army go away pretty quickly. Marius himself has a lot of so social and political tensions that remain just permanently for forever. It seems like uh, I'm not going to get into that, but um. But the army gets massive. Rome is more easily able to answer the, the problems around, uh, around all of its uh, territories uh, across the Mediterranean. Um, it's just like the power of Rome is greatly expanded by this. But one of the big, the big problem of this and why this is looked at as one of the greatest, uh, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic uh, is the marriage reform is viewed as one of the beginnings of the end of the Roman Republic, at least as a, an official thing is that these armies, well, they're all about being paid. And, you know, unlike today, like uh, uh, a serviceman in the American military, you know, they can get, especially with the internet, can get paid and check their balance even throughout somewhere around the world. And, and, you know, they get that payment from the United States government. In this case, a lot of times the generals would pay their armies. You know, the money's supposed to come from taxes levied uh, by the, um, uh, by the Roman government, uh, but there would be a lot of times where the men just that, that payment didn't come for whatever reason. The Rome and the generals would be like, "Okay, we need to make sure these men get paid because the, they become unruly. Unpaid soldiers become not happy soldiers, and you don't want to have unhappy soldiers." And then pretty quickly, people start realizing uh, that uh, well, soldiers you become more loyal to those generals, especially if you're a winning general, you know, because you win those battles and they give you a share of the loot and stuff like that. And so it comes to the point where there's their loyalty is so much more on the side of the generals that the, um, that if a general say were to turn against Rome itself, well, these soldiers would follow that if they felt like it was in their best interest. And, because of this, even though in the, in the beginning, this just, holy cow, you have this massive militaristic power that Rome is, but as different generals kind of get their own different political stances and realize that they have the means to enforce their ways, well, that's when you start getting civil war starting. And Rome has not had a civil war this entire time. Uh, hundreds of years, no civil war. And now after the Marius reform, uh, and not long after the Marius reform, you get multiple civil wars. So anyways, actually, I won't go into the first civil war right now. I'm going to end this video at this point, but these are two of the big band-aid fixes. There are other reforms going on as well. These are two of the big ones to know it does just really transform Roman society, the, the Gracchus reforms and the Marius reforms. Uh, both, uh, especially the Gracchus reforms, very well intentioned, you could say. Uh, Marius reform, you hope there's well intention there again study the life of Marius and you don't really know if it is but um, uh, anyways but you could also argue that there were needed reforms but because they're uh, especially the marriage reform because it undermines the initial reasons why Rome became became massive and great in the first place well you start seeing these cracks that lead into civil wars so with that we'll start talking about the civil wars next time